Good morning. You're listening to WPVM LP in Asheville, North Carolina, 103.7 on your dial. This is the Blainswell Show, heard each Wednesday here at 9 a.m., and you can also watch us on WPVM's Facebook page. I'm your host, Blaine Greenfield, in my Zoom studio in lovely downtown Fairview, North Carolina, and each week we focus on the Asheville theater scene, as well as on positive news and information about people and organizations in both Western North Carolina and throughout the country. And toward that end, it's my pleasure to introduce my first guest, and she is Nancy Lawson. And Nancy, you can feel free to wave to all your fans and friends on Facebook. Hello, so, how are you? Thank you for having me here today. Well, it's my pleasure. And that's Nancy Lawson. And she, along with her husband, Barry, purchased <coughs> Curbside Management, also known as Kirby, in 2006. The facility is located in Woodfin, North Carolina. Kirby collects, I love that name, Nancy, by the way. Kirby collects and processes recyclables for Western North Carolina. The Lawsons have lived in the area for many years and enjoy having others learn more about recycling and sustainable living. I have to say, first of all, thank you for being my guest because I know like very little about recycling. And so the question I have to ask you is that, as a kid, you grew up where? Um, in Chicagoland, in Illinois. Okay. Both my husband and I grew up there, yes. And when you, the two of you grew up in Illinois, did you always know you want to be in recycling? No, sir. No, sir. We were actually in the restaurant business for years. And um, through um, various different things, we we actually um, purchased curbside management in 2006. So we've owned it since then. And um, it, we've just taken off from there. But yeah, we do. We do enjoy. We do enjoy that portion of our of our of our business that we are actually taking care of the environment one bottle and can at a time. So we do like that aspect very much of our but, business. But what got you to buy into curbside into curbside recycling? We have actually retired from another uh, restaurant business, right. and um, we're actually we had home parents, and we were retired. We were the um, field trip moms and dads, and we went to all. Of the sporting goods we were retired for a number of years early in our lives in our in our 40s and then our children started going away to college and we had just retired way too early and so we looked for another business that suited our skill sets um, but also was something that interests us and we found curbside management this recycling company so it was always already an established company when we purchased it it managed your skill set. What, what skill sets were those? Um, my husband and I were restaurant owners. Right. So um, the type of employees were very similar, um, entry-level employees. And so we were used to managing those type of, of people. You don't manage hamburgers, you manage people, right? And so we, we had that skill set. We had a lot of customers in our, our restaurant business. Um, we have a lot of customers here. Just in the city of Asheville alone, there are 30,000 households that we collect and service from. And then there's a lot of, uh, my husband has a mechanical background. So um, there's a lot of equipment. And so where he was used to repairing things. So many of the same skill sets were translated into this business. Also. In 2006, how did you find out that this business was available for sale? We went through a business broker. Yes. Okay. And the, the rest is history. Yes. The, um, so all of a sudden you get into this business, which you knew though very little about, right? You, you know, that you knew about the restaurant industry. And yes. I guess there's some similarity in the restaurant business. You had to get rid of food. You know, at the end of the day, you had to throw away stuff, you know. Yes. Um, yes. Before you got into this, had you been like a recycling bug or were you into that? You know, um, not, not extreme. <laughs> Um, we did recycle at home, but probably not as much as we do now, but um, we were always, we live in a beautiful area of Asheville, in Asheville, North Carolina, hiking, you know, the kayaking, everything we enjoyed, being outside, our children loved being outside, and so it did fit into that, that need to take care of this beautiful nature that, that um, we have here. Now, to your credit, and this is why I'm so impressed with your business, is that most of the people in the industry are part of larger firms or they like, I won't mention some of the other people in the area, but they have many areas they service. You just service this one area? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, we, um, we're just privately owned and operated. We raised our family here. So the decisions we make are based on our community and 
it affects where we live. It's not some corporate person up in another state somewhere that are making decisions for us. Um, we like that. We um, we like that we live in um, and do business in, in the community. Now, is that exception in the industry? Are most people owned by corporate? You know, I think it's kind of, yeah, I think it is. Most of um, um, big, huge um, material recovery facilities like we own um, are owned by larger corporations. Yes. So we, now yeah. you're you're yeah. outside of Asheville. You're in what what part of Asheville are you? We're just in North Asheville, in a just north, which is in Woodfin. 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 Yeah. But that's considered part of Asheville, though. It is. So yeah. it's just an area of Asheville. And how many homes did you say you, you you're responsible for? Well, just in in the city of Asheville alone, there's over thirty thousand households. That we actually have two parts of our business. One part is where we actually go and collect the recyclables from the residents. We go door to door to door and collect um, recyclables curbside and we do that for a number of different communities and municipalities in our area and then and also businesses and also factories so we have the collection part of our business and then we have the material recovery facility part of our business so whatever we collect we bring back to our facility as well as everybody else like waste management waste pro all of the other haulers um, <clears throat> Republic Services, CWS, all the other people, then the haulers in the area that are collecting their recyclables, they bring the recyclables to our material recovery facility, as well as other counties in the area. We, um, we probably cover most of Western North Carolina, up into Tennessee, down into South Carolina. We have a huge area of territory where they bring the recyclables to our facility here. And then here is where we sort and separate all the recyclables into individual materials, like all cardboard, all plastic bottles, all paper. And then through a number of processes in our system mechanically and by um, our employees, we sort and separate that stuff, we bail it up, and then we market to companies that actually utilize that material and make it into something else. How many employees do you have? We have about seventy. We have okay. About seventy employees. And this is and the recycle the uh, the second part of the business. Where is that located? In North Asheville. Okay. So talk about that again. I'm showing my lack of knowledge about the whole subject, but you know I, I've gotten like you said, like you're more into recycling. You know, um, yet. I guess I could always do more. And part of the, the thing, and you're going to teach me here and teach others, is that we don't really know the ins and outs of recycling, you know. And you never, it's funny, Nancy, you never really taught that. You know, you, in, in school, I don't recall ever learning that. Anybody ever? I'm now learning that in school, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, great. which is great. But as a kid, I didn't, you know. And I don't, I don't think my parents ever taught me, you know, <laughs> that. But let me ask, put on the spot here, kind of read aside just version. So as a, as a resident in Asheville area, what should we be doing in terms of recycling? Well, the first thing you should do is probably go to either our website or the city of Asheville website or your community's Ashlight website and find out what can be accepted in, our, in the recycling program and what cannot. What we can and cannot accept is 100% dependent on whether or not we have a factory or manufacturer that's close by to us that will actually take that material and make it into something else. So we can collect everything we want, but if we don't have a home for it, it kind of defeats the purpose. Well, well let me just jump okay. in a second and then yeah. I'll, I'll have you go further on that. So you mentioned the website. Your website is what, Nancy? www.kirby.com. That's C-U-R-B-I-E.com. Okay, and that's for anybody that can get just general information recycling. Absolutely. Go further on what you just said, though. So you said stuff that you can accept and not accept, but I imagine the problem you face is that a lot of people, though, dump lots of stuff that they shouldn't be dumping. Is that a problem? We, we call those wishful recyclers. <laughs> <laughs> we bet that they, they wish it was recyclable, and so they don't quite know what to do with it, so they put it in the recycling bin, hoping that it is. And that actually causes us a causes us a lot of um, 
a lot of inefficiencies and costs and things. We are not a waste company either. We are 100% a recycling company. That's also what makes us unique uh, as to some of those other larger companies and other MERPs is that we're not owned by a waste company. We are 100% recycling. So- well, well, talk about, you mentioned then some stuff like that you called it wish, you know, wishful- Wishful recyclers, whatever. Yeah. Give me some okay. examples of, of stuff that people do dump to you. Well, how about if I start off and go through like some of the things that you can recycle? Okay, please. And then I'll go into some of the things that you can't. Okay. So as um, plastics, plastics are really confusing. And we get probably most of our questions about plastics because they are, they're confusing. So what I tell people is to ask yourself three questions when you're recycling something that's plastic. Number one, it doesn't have a recycling symbol on it. Doesn't matter what the number is inside the recycling symbol, but if does it have a recycling symbol on it? And is it a container, container, container? And does it roughly come from a grocery store? So I, that is jugs, tubs, bottles, and plastic jars. That's what we can recycle and accept here in our program. So for example, is a hanger recyclable? No, because it's not a container, right? Is a plastic toy recyclable? No, it's not a container. I'm looking for bottles, tubs, jugs, and plastic jars. Those are the type of things. By the way, yes. if somebody then has, what, what are people supposed to do with hangers, for example? You need to throw them in your trash. Okay, so I should understand this, or people should understand it. So in your area where you, you, you uh, collect stuff, there are also people who collect trash. Is that so? That we're, I think we got the difference. So you don't collect trash. Is that correct? Sir, no, sir, we do. Okay. Where do people who you collect from, where do they put their stuff in it? Do they have a bin for that? Yes, there's a, there's a garbage receptacle for their garbage or your trash. And then you have a receptacle right. just for recyclable material. Right. That's what we have. And it's right. labeled just recycling. And so, and that gets picked up how often? I mean, it depends on your, your community. Um, we have some communities that are picked up weekly and we have some communities that we pick up every other week. It depends on the schedule. Yeah, we get picked up every other week. But, and you're teaching me, the whole key though, use that as much as I can, fill it as much as I can, but it has to be stuff that's recyclable, you know, and, 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 and exactly. if not, it just goes in the garbage. It does, it does. Okay, are there, you were talking, are there some other things I'll talk about cardboard. How does yes. cardboard come into play? Yes, um, we do recycle cardboard. We recycle um, the the corrugated cardboard with the with the the layers and the zigzag in the middle of it. We recycle um, also like thin cardboard boxes, like your cereal boxes and your cracker boxes, that kind of thing. And as far as paper goes, pretty much if you can tear it, we can recycle it. So we can't take anything like um, something that's laminated or plastic coated or something that's heavily waxed. Um, but other than that, we can we can take the paper. The other thing that that is important when you when it comes to paper is the size. We can't take shredded paper in a recycling bin. And basically, it's because of our our processing system. Um, this the little pieces of paper don't get where they're supposed to be. They usually get put in our glass. They they get lost on our floor. So the size of the paper and of anything that we recycle has to be about two and a half inches or more in diameter in order for us to make sure that it gets processed. Now, if people recycle paper, and I try to though. Before they put it in that bin, though, they should take out the staples? No, a little bit of staples, really? a window envelope um, in a window. The window in the window envelope is fine to recycle. A little bit of staples, a little bit of tape, oh, really? it doesn't matter. Just excessive. We can't take like three ring binders. We can't take that um, that metal, you know, springy thing that holds like a, a bunch of paper together. No um, clamps or clips. Um, but a little bit of staples is fine. What about pizza boxes? Um, that's something you get asked about a lot. Um, basically, you can recycle the top of it, but the bottom part of the of the pizza box, if it's saturated with oil, 
um, you need to tear the box in half, recycle the top part, but then the bottom part that's saturated with oil needs to be put in the trash. How about uh, Amazon boxes? Oh yeah, ab ab absolutely, absolutely. The, uh, I'll, I'm making a note to send you a clip. My favorite- the One thing that we cannot take is the Amazon um, uh, envelopes, the plastic em Amazon envelopes. Those are not accepted in our program. I don't know if you saw it, but one of my favorite YouTube clips of all time is a wife was trying to get back at her husband on April Fool's Day. Have you ever seen this one? Yes, sir. And you can imagine this. So she collected all the boxes for a year and on April Fool's Day, she put out all the boxes in front of her house. You know, So the husband comes home instead of seeing the recycling, she saw like 600 boxes, you know, and he wasn't a happy camper. You know, and that, that was our April Fool's joke. But yes. give me an easy way though, you can teach me this also. So my wife is pretty good on recycling all that stuff, but okay. is there an easy way to cut? Because it has to fit in the, the bin, right? What you put in. As far as the, the cardboard box? Right. Yeah, um, most of the communities have pretty large bins. If you can fit it and break it down flat and put it into your recycling bin, that's the best thing. But if you have extra boxes and don't have enough room in your recycling bin. Right now, our program allows that if you break down the cardboard boxes and set it beside your recycling bin, we will take it, but it can't be more than four feet tall. It has okay. to be, you know, but it needs to be broken down. What if people have, um, be it Christmas time or some other time, they have an excess amount of stuff to be recycled. Can they right. call you or can you get a second pickup or how does that work? You can always take your excess recyclables to the Buckham County Transfer Station. They they receive um, recyclable material for free. Um, you can you can put out an extra cardboard box and fill it up with the recyclables as long as it's next to the recycling bin and we clearly know that it's recyclables that we need to pick it up to. You can put that out on your recycling day also. But you're probably the best bet if you have a lot is to take it to the transfer station. And where is the transfer station? It's off of Bavard Road in, in um, West Asheville. Okay, so people, so I guess one of the, the jobs you're trying to do is to get people to recycle more or, yes. because yes. I, I won't mention the person's name, but I was very upset. She actually worked for me and she just refused to, you know, put stuff in recycling. You know, she just didn't, didn't want to be bothered. Is there a percentage or ballpark idea of how many people do actively recycle? Actually, the city of Asheville is very, has very high percentages of recycling. Um, we're probably number one or two, we're probably two or three in the state, I believe, um, with the percentage of participation um, for recycling. So you have to make it easy. So if you're going to be a, a recycler at home, you need to have a convenient place for it to be placed. And um, you just, you just need to make it easy. And we're trying to make it easy. So one of the things that, that um, the state has developed is um, this little um, picture um, postcard. We have this on our website. It's also on the city of Asheville. That kind of explains what you can recycle and how to recycle it. Would you like me to go over more of the things? Yeah, and it's funny you say that because we actually got that postcard somehow. Okay. We post it by our recycling bin, you know, so yeah. when we go out. But yeah, please, that's, that's a super book. And by the way, you mentioned if folks want a, a super flyer, if folks want to get a copy of this, they can go to your website and get it? Um, yeah, there, there is copies of that. Um, you can also get it through the city of Asheville. Um, they send it out free to their residents. Okay. And so um, and one thing I'll ask you before you go over the um, flyer there is that what made a life a lot easier for us is that a couple of years ago, they went to separate bins. And those used to be, it wasn't clear, you know, what was recyclable. And, and we got a whole new recyclable bin or something about two years ago in, in Fairview. And they're really nice. You know, it's a very large size. Also, you had, we had a choice to get a small one or a large one. Why would anybody get a small one though? Or It just depends. They might, they might live in a smaller home gotcha. and they don't have enough room for a larger um, bin, a rollout bin. And so we, they do offer, some of the communities offer a little smaller bin just for, for space issues at their home. I don't know if you see this with other people. It's amazing, Nancy, like clockwork at two weeks, boy, is always full. You know, it's just not after one week. And I, I, I don't know how it works, but 
I don't know if other people tell you that, but just perfect. It always fills up after two weeks, you know. And then they figured and, out what 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 a normal person recycles in a couple so, of weeks. So I guess I feel honored we're, we're somewhat normal then. If it takes two weeks to recycle. Yes. If you would please, you were mentioning some of the things on that. Um, yeah, I, I, there. I started off and I was talking about plastic bottles and containers, and that's that's very confusing. Um, one of the other things that we take is aluminum cans, like aluminum beverage cans, and um, steel cans, like your soup cans, those kind of things, and then um, glass bottles and jars. Now, just bottles and jars, we can't take any... Um, window glass or any glass glasses or any ceramics. It's just glass bottles and jars. And it's because the factory that we send them to, that's the only thing that they'll accept at this time. No, when we send it, when we leave it for you to pick up, we can keep the tops on or no? Um, for the for the plastic bottles and jars, you do want them to be on. Um, the manufacturers have changed their processing a little bit. They realize that the cap is a different type of plastic than the bottle itself, but they melt them down in two different temperatures and actually utilize both types of plastics. And so in order for the cap to make sure that it gets recycled, because those little caps are small, they can get all over our floor, they cannot get where they're supposed to be. They need to be screwed on tightly to the plastic bottle in order them to be um, recycled. How, now, about the how about the glass bottle? Um, beer caps should not be recycled, should not be placed in the recycling bin. They're just too small. They'll get everywhere. They'll get not where they're supposed to be. How about soda? Uh, so, uh, soda, a bottle of soda. Do, do I keep the tops on? That's usually plastic. So yes, yes. Okay, that's the criteria. If it's plastic, it can be kept on. Yes. Okay. Let's say you had a pickle jar and you left the, I would, if I was doing it at home, I would take the, the metal lid off of the pickle jar and recycle them both together because the metal does get recycled. It'll, it'll go through our system and get picked up our, by our magnet. And, or even if it's on, the way our system does is that the glass is broken and then that cap will keep, keep going down the road, if that makes sense. Let me ask you a question, which you probably get asked from other people, but, you know, I always kind of wonder, you know, do you guys really recycle this stuff or do you put some of it in a landfill? Or do, do you, I guess you people have to put that all the time. And um, I wish people would come out for a tour here because it is crazy. We, um, we are in the recycling business. We're not in the trash business and anything that um, it, it costs us to take things to the landfill. Probably overall, um, with the wishful recyclers and the people that are putting bags <laughs> and things that don't belong, we probably have um, close to maybe about 8% um, percent of actual trash that we have to take. And it costs us close to $10,000 a month just in landfill fees. Now, that doesn't even count the labor that we're pulling it, the bailing, the transportation to the landfill and back. It's just our tipping fees alone at the landfill are close to $10,000 a month. We are highly motivated <laughs> to find homes and to actually recycle the material that people put in their bins because that's what we're, that's what we're here for and that's our business. Now you mentioned something, I don't know if you were kidding about it, but you mentioned you like people to take a tour. Are they allowed to do that? Um, we do. It's very limited. Um, it's just a, it's my husband and I's company. So we don't have um, a tremendous amount of, of time to devote to just tours. But yeah, if you have a larger group, um, you can give me a call and I would be happy to, um, to set up a time for you to come and see our facility. Here. And how long does tour, how long does tour, how long does it take? About 30 minutes. I kind of go over um, when they come for the tour. I kind of go over um, what can be recycled, how to recycle things, the process and how it's sorted and separated through our facility, and then kind of where it goes to. Um, however, on our website right now, on Kirby.com, I have a video where that actually you see the process of a piece of what, what happens to recyclables and how it gets sorted and separated. So look at our website for that video probably. Super. First. So you, you were going over that brochure though. You just want to, yes. they had in front of you. Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, this brochure tells you what can be recycled, but on the back, um, it shows, it says, know your nose is what this the back says. And so maybe I'll go over a little bit about the top few things that you should not put in your recycling bin that, that is really a nuisance for us. Okay, and let me, yeah. by the way, just interrupt you for a second and compliment you here because you are certainly the most enthusiastic person I've ever met about recycling. I mean, I, I just love your smile. I love yes, your- I do. No, but, but you seem to really enjoy it though, do you? We do. we do. And especially teaching people like me who know nothing about recycling, if you can just bring up a little bit, I guess you've, you've done you've done good deed for the, the uh, day. So yeah, teach me some more of the no's. Okay, so probably the top few things that we don't want you to put in your recycling bin, number one is bags. Bags, bags, bags should never be placed in your recycling bin. So we ask that you, if you can gather your recyclables in a bag, but we ask that you dump out the bag and so that all the recyclables are loose into your container. So, so the plastic bag is what you're talking about, like plastic what, Ingle, bags. from Ingles. But, yes, we but don't you won't want any of that. Well, let me ask you this just for advice. So you won't uh, take plastic bags, but you will take the paper bags. Is that correct? The what? The paper bags, the garbage bag. Bags. Oh yeah, paper bags are fine. Just plastic bags are not. Well, and when it comes to here, here's why. You can recycle those plastic bags, but they need to be taken to um, Walmart and Ingalls and other department stores have a little box out in the front of right, the I've seen them. Yeah. door. You want to put your plastic bags in there. And those actually do get recycled. They're taken to someplace in Virginia where they actually make a type of a plastic lumber out of them. But when they get to our facility, we cannot keep them clean enough for that factory to utilize them. So just, just for instance, let's say you had a bag of recyclables and it's going down our line. Our, our pre-cert guys, what they do is they grab the bag, they have to tear it open, Here. they then have to shake it, and then they toss it into the, um, the trash chute. And so along with, by shaking it, sometimes like a real sticky soda can or something else stays with the bag and we can't keep enough labor, we can't put enough labor into those plastic bags in order for them to be recycled at our facility. So then they're trash here and we have to pay to get them landfill. And you've given me a, a, a I think a, a good idea, if it makes sense, is that when I next go grocery shopping, to ask for it in paper bags, you know, um, because that's, I guess, directly <laughs> better. Better is to bring your own um, oh. reusable bag. And I've done. <laughs> point well, well, well taken. Let me ask you that. We're running out of time here. Let me ask you this question, uh, Nancy. So you mentioned how to get more information about your firm. Are okay. you folks uh, hiring as well? Always, always. Okay. We we have a driving staff and drivers helpers, and then we have um, picker sorters on our line, forklift drivers, um, baler operators. Yeah, we, we are constantly hiring. Yes, okay. sir. Again, that information will be at the website. Um, you can call us at 828-252-2532 for more information about um, employment okay. opportunities. And I guess the, 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 I'll, I'll just give a... Um, a plug, I, I guess, if I can, for your company or the industry, that the great thing about that is it seems like a, there's always going to be a need for people in recycling. Yes, sir. You know, I mean, that, that's just, and have you seen that since you started? Have you had we growth? Have, we've, um, a lot of our sorting processes has gotten um, more mechanical. We have a lot of machines, fiber optics, a robot, um, an eddy current, magnets, um, ballistics that actually sort the material. But there's always going to be needing, we're always going to need a live person that will um, help us glean and a quality control our material so that we make it make sure we have a good product to send to those companies that are making them into something else. Okay. I'd like to thank you, Nancy Lawson, for being my guest this first half hour on the Blaine's Well, this is just really, I'm telling you, I came into this knowing nothing about recycling. So now I know maybe this little, but thank you much. It was you really, I just welcome. love your enthusiasm. And um, someday maybe I'll surprise you and, um, and take a tour of the, your recycling facility. Thanks much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Okay. You'll be well. Okay. And as Nancy works her way out of the studio, um, I'm going to welcome our second guest in just a second, but I'd like to remind our listeners that you're listening to the Blaineswell Show here on WPVM, and our uh, 
What we try to do is foster community through programming that cultivates dialogue to inform and entertain. The station provides the medium for artists, businesses, community leaders, and nonprofits to share their voice on live radio, also on Facebook. Listeners are invited to help support WPVM's efforts by making a tax deductible contribution. You can do so by going to the website, wpvmfm.org, and looking at the donate option on the upper right-hand side. My second guest today is Vincent Jenna, and uh, Vincent is a psychic therapist, medium, spiritual teacher, and author, and welcome aboard, Vincent. Hey, it's great to be here, Blaine. Okay. I learned a lot about uh, recycling while I was listening. Okay, well, thanks for listening. You can also wave to all your fans and friends in Facebook world. So this is Vincent right. Jenna, and um, I got to love that shirt. Great, good looking shirt. And yeah, Vincent, thank you. Vincent is an internationally renowned renowned uh, psychic therapist, medium, and spiritual teacher and author. Vincent uses his almost 40 years of training. You're another guy, Vincent. You started the same thing too when you were about eight? When I was eight years old. That's when all my experience <laughs> and research began. You're right, Blaine. Experience as a metaphysician, psychotherapist, and spiritual teacher to delve deep into the psyche, empowering clients to heal their issues of body, mind, and spirit. Dancers and followers around the world have been inspired and empowered by Vincent's warm and genuine keynote presentations and self-love and self-mastery as in, is in its views on um, various radio and television shows, including now Plains World. His readings and events are enlightening and energizing, as you'll see. And he's also now the author of a book, which I just got a hold of myself. Thanks to Vincent. The secrets that's holding you, you back. Exactly. And Vincent, the, the first question I ask is, you and I were talking off the air. You grew up in New York originally? Yes, I did. I was actually born in the Queens area, Maspeth, New York, at Jamaica Hospital, by the way, which is still there. And uh, then my family, by the age of nine, we moved out to Levittown, Long Island. And that's where I grew up until I was about 22 years old and then went off to California to pursue my first career. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. But what I asked when you grew up in Levittown, and I told you off there, I grew up nearby in Freeport, then uh, yeah. Lawrence. As a kid, did you always know you wanted to be this um, author, psychic? Medium? Are you kidding me? No, <laughs> I was an actor, Blaine. I don't I, know if you knew that. I was a professional singer, actor, and dancer. I started very young as a, as a kid. And um, all I cared about was doing movies and Broadway and TV shows. Uh, the psychic world I had nothing to do with at all, especially in a small town like Levittown. That was people over in California and movies that I saw. That's about all I knew about the psychic and the paranormal world totally. By the way, I could definitely see you as a performer and painter. Uh, do you still do oh. that? Do you still do that at all? Uh, actually, I stopped. Um, it was a few years ago. I stopped doing it professionally. I was a, a union actor. And when I moved here to North Carolina, they have a regional theater here. Sure. And I was still able to perform. I did 21 shows for them and leads and um, had a great time doing it. But this profession, it just transformed over into me doing speaking engagements now. So I, I kind of have my own one man show. I still sing, though. I sing at my events. Well, talk about oh, interesting. I should have known that. I would have put you on the spot. Uh, oh, talk, no. 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 <laughs> talk about being a psychic. So what got you into being a psychic? Um, well, <laughs> it was thrust upon me like a tsunami on a shore. <laughs> Bam. Um, you know, I, I wish I, I get to meet so many people doing the work that we do, right? I'm, and my work on my end, a lot of paranormal and spiritual people. And I hear all these wonderful stories about these people who walked into their bedroom when they were five or six years old and there was an angel sitting on their bed. And I, I was, you know, just so envious of that. I, usually when I walked into my bedroom at five years old, it was my mother ready to smack me the side of my head for something <laughs> I did wrong. I don't know what it was. And it was no angel there. Um, but I was, it, it actually begins from me having been the bullied one in school. I was the tormented one until I was 17 years old. And there was a kid who did most of the antagonizing. He actually instigated the jocks to always pick on me, whether it was in the middle of class or was it whether it was between classes after school, the kid chased me, beat me up, shoved me in lock his head, flushed in toilet, beat on, spit <laughs> on. All of that stuff was done to me. And this kid, so he became my enemy. 
But then fortune or providence would have it that I wound up landing a role in the movie Grease. That was my big claim to fame, okay. um, especially at that age, right? And so when it came out, it became an instant blockbuster, right? So sure. a small town guy is in this very famous movie and it was, you know, ads about me in newspaper articles. And I was, oh, I was everywhere in the local television show. And then my high school reunion came up, my first high school reunion. I was married. We already had a three-year-old child and my wife and I went to the reunion and I went with, yeah, I would have to say that I went with a chip on my shoulder. It actually, it was more like a two by four. <laughs> I had attitude, that's for sure. Um, because I wanted to show them, hey, look, guys, you know, you picked on me, but I became something, you know. And it was actually a very surprising turnout and outcome. It was a Cinderella story, really. Um, I went to the ball and everybody just stopped and paid so much attention to me. The girls sat around my table, the <laughs> jockettes, the ones who also picked on me. Oh, so many of them were apologizing. They wanted to hear all the stories of Hollywood. So we had so much fun. But the guy who was the instigator, my enemy, I get to the hall and he shouts across the room my name and the hall freezes. Everybody thought that this guy, what is he going to do? Oh, my God, he's going to pick on him. They didn't know what he was going to do. Well, he ran up to me. He grabbed me in a bear hug, Blaine, and he wouldn't let me go. And in that hug, I didn't hear him say, I'm sorry. I felt his heart tell me that, his soul tell me that. And we instantaneously bonded as friends. Well, to pop ahead a couple of years now, we're really close, but I'm still living in California, finally moved back to New York. And we get together and all I could hear from him is when you asked, he was the type of guy that you asked, how are you doing? And the next two hours was just about him and how <laughs> fabulous and how successful he was and is married and he had to his childhood sweetheart, three children, his job, he's a boss at work. He's got this gorgeous condo in Connecticut. All I kept hearing is BS, BS. I don't know why I was knowing that. After spending a weekend with him, my wife and I, it was just with him. His, his wife was out of town with the kids, supposedly. Um, we were driving home and I couldn't stop myself from crying. And when my wife asked me what was wrong, I said, my heart is breaking. I, I just know there's something wrong with him. I, I, I don't know what it is and I don't know how to help him. And she's like, what are you crazy? He lives in this gorgeous condo in Connecticut. And I'm like, no, that's not it. Something is terribly wrong with his life. And, um, and so I started to cry out to God for help. I never turned to God. I was a good altar boy at 13 years old because <laughs> in New York, and if you're Italian and you're a boy at 13, you must be an altar boy so that you can guarantee a space in heaven for your family. Um, I don't know how much I did that <laughs> while I was eating the host and drinking the wine behind the altar there. And, you know, and I don't know what guarantee is, but um, that was my only closeness to God. I used to argue with the priest telling them that they were teaching God and Jesus wrong. Boy, in hindsight, I had no idea that that's why I was doing it. So I cry out to God to give me the ability to help this guy and people like him because I knew what it was from being tormented to have your esteem just broken down and taken away from you, all your self-belief and self-love. It was within a week, and you'd appreciate this character, Cecil B. DeMille, and Steven Spielberg, let me tell you something, they couldn't get together and make the biggest epic movie that would happen to my life within the next couple of months after that prayer. It was amazing. It was paranormal upon paranormal, and everybody thought that I was going crazy except my <laughs> wife, because she was with me since I was 17 years old, so she knew what I didn't know. And all of a sudden, my head was being flooded with knowledge and wisdom, ancient wisdom, it turned out. We looked at it in the, in the library, and we kept seeing all these words and texts and content of things I was saying. Then I was reading people's minds, Blaine, and then I was able to tell what was going to happen to them the next day and in the future. And I was seeing what happened in the past.
Um, the actual mediumship part started later on, but then that wound up developing. So it all happened because I wanted to help this friend. And then I was told I was going to be a spiritual teacher and not be a professional actor. I didn't like that idea, but that's how it evolved. And that was the abridged version of the story. You should hear the unabridged version. You'd need a couple of days. Fast forward to that story, though. So with this person who had been your tormentor in high school, um, were you able to help him or are you still in touch with him? Let me tell you something. He's my greatest fan. He was my first spiritual student. Not only did I help him, he became a spiritual teacher himself. Um, very happy. He has an incredible life right now. I was right. His wife had left him, took the children. He lost his job. He had back issues and needed surgery. He was losing his townhouse. Everything I had felt I was absolutely right on. And we talked forever to be able to get him on the right track with himself using the stuff I was just gaining Blaine I was a, a novice and I was giving him so yes he surprises me and comes to my events he's given me permission to use his name his his story is in my book and his name is there with it and so he's he's a dear still a dear friend and a great guy now the um you have me curious about the fact that you met him at your first reunion have you been back to other reunions Let's put it this way. I went to the 10th, the 20th, the 30th, and the 40th, and they dedicated them all to me. Very nice. It was very, It was an honor because the way they treated me, but here was the thing. Because I had let go, I didn't actually have any anger or hatred towards them, so there was nothing to forgive. I actually thought... I probably deserved it because my mother was beating me at home too because she had some <laughs> issues. So I figured I was a geek and maybe I did deserve to be picked on like that. So I never blamed them, but I knew in my heart something was wrong in their past. And so because I was able to still love them and let them let go of what they had done to me, they loved me in return. I even have one of my, my friends here who was I mean, he caused great torment for me back in seventh grade, and he purposely moved from Florida and North Carolina to be near me. So, yes, they are. We're in touch with each other all the time. So talk about then you graduated high school, went on, did acting. So what decided what led to the decision aside from this experience to become what you are now? And also talk about how you. You learned this whole stuff. You studied or how do you get the skills? Oh, my gosh. Well, here's what happened. As soon as this happened, I was 28 years old, Blaine, and I was told that I would be directed to the right people. My guides told me and outside sources would give me these messages that I'd be directed to the right people to understand what to do with what was happening to me. And they were popping up all over the place out of the woodwork. And I had never expected it before between automatic writers and other psychics um, and people who had studied the new age information. I didn't know from new age other than poltergeist and movies like that, like <laughs> right. I said. And when I was in California doing the movie, and so um, I was directed to go to Edgar Casey the Foundation in Virginia Beach. Sure. And man, did I study. I took so many courses. I wanted to know what I knew. And I wanted to know what I was supposed to know and do with it. And it was really difficult because I loved the information right away and was able to accept it. All this, this wonderful paranormal and metaphysical and spiritual information about who we are, Blaine. Um, what I didn't have a, a, an easy time accepting is that I would, had to be a psychic. I was going to be a psychic. I didn't even like the word. Right. And so because to me, the psychics were Sister Sarah with the palm outside, you know, <laughs> on the highway. You're driving on the highway, you got Sister Sarah in a tiny little shack, you know, and you go in and she's got tarot cards and a crystal ball. That was my image. And that was a lot of people's image. Right. And I didn't want to do that. So I actually started doing part time readings. I was immediately guided into doing readings and sessions for people. So I called myself an intuitive counselor or a transpersonal counselor. That sounded so much better than psychic. And, um, and that kept going on. And interestingly, at the time, I was still pursuing an acting career, but then Providence stepped in again when we had our second child to let me know I wasn't meant to do acting anymore. 
And it got me a job as a motivational teacher at an entertainment company. So I started to do that work and I had went into my own business and doing that kind of, of work and I was enjoying it. But um, a car accident took me out of that job and it wasn't my fault. A young girl had hit me. She couldn't control her father's stick shift car came right out in front of me and I had hit into her. Thank God she didn't get hurt, but I got injured enough that I couldn't do that work anymore. I couldn't go anywhere with my job. I didn't know what to do. So some of my part-time clients said to me, why don't you go back to school and get your psychotherapy degree? And then my wife, they said, I got more therapy from you than I get from my own counselor. I went, wow, me go back to school? That would take a long time. I didn't have any college background at all. And my wife said, you know what? What better way to combine your intuition and your psychicness with what you would learn as a psychotherapist about the human mind, I thought, that's perfect. So I did. I started back to school. I went to Thomas Edison in New Jersey, then at went Rutgers University. We got a calling to move down here to North Carolina, and I was accepted as a transfer student. So I got my BA in psychology and my master's in clinical social work. And so I figure now that I'm going into the, the minds with my psychic ability, then knowing the mind and all about it really helped me go deeper where a lot of other psychics don't want to go. Now you could really call me a psychic and a psycho. I mean, therapist. <laughs> well, it's very, okay. very impressive about your background. Like you said, I know a bunch of other psychics, but none have quite that background or, or the academic background that you combine the two is kind of a neat you know, a combination. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. And it was really important for me. And it was so funny, too, because when you go for the degree, masses in clinical social work, you have supervisors while you're doing your internship. And my supervisors would tell me, they'd say, Vince, you must have some kind of sixth sense when you're working with new clients because you can diagnose them absolutely accurately within the first five minutes of meeting them. It takes us a couple of visits. I don't know how you do that. And I'm like, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know how I do it. It must be a sick. I was about ready to tell him, oh, I'm psychic, like Sister Sarah on the highway down the block. No, I wasn't going to tell him that, right? So I kept that to myself, but I used it. And it was so funny because... As a psychic therapist or, psych or psychotherapist at the time, I did, they helped me start my own practice. I had two offices actually. Um, and then all of a sudden a friend of mine and my wife that she grew, went to school with and grew up, she was a manager over at a hospice organization, Duke Hospice here in North Carolina. And she calls me up one day and she said, we have an opening for a clinical social worker. You'd be fantastic in it. And I'm like, wow, working with the dead now the, or the dying? <laughs> Whoa, that would be an incredible experience. And just at that time, my ability to see deceased people, dead people started happening. And I started seeing people's spirits of, of deceased loved ones. So I was asking for guidance. And sure enough, I wound up taking that job. And Blaine, it was one of the greatest things that I did. I worked with over 500 patients, helping them to cross over, as well as helping their caregivers and their loved ones. And I learned more about the living by working with the dying. How long, did you, have, how long was, did you have that for? Um, oh, gosh, I did that for about six years. And then you got to listen to this part of the story, which is all what all of this has led me to my book. Because all of this experience, it's all filling in my head and I'm learning why people are having a hard time creating the lives they want. I'm watching them and then talking with those at the end of their life um, and, and learning as, as much. But as with anything in the healthcare industry, it started really turning into a business and I didn't like it. I could no longer stay with my patients at all. I had to refer them over if they wanted counseling or to talk to somebody. We had to just sign people up, sign people up. That was it. And so again, I turned to God and I said, all right, you helped me with this once before. You got to help me again. Universe, you got to get me out of this business. Bam. On my way to work one day, another young girl hit me from behind. 
Blaine, you know, I'm 67 years old and I can proudly say that at least two times in my life, a young, beautiful blonde girl hit on me. But Great. she was in the car. And that was that was that story. So it took me out of social work. I wound up having sustaining brainstem injury. I had double vision for five years. I couldn't drive. I was on workers comp. I couldn't do my job. And in the social work here, you you have to have a license to be able to go out into and do outreach programs or to drive to work. So I couldn't do that. So I'm like, all right. You took me out of this business. Well, I actually helped to create that. God didn't give me the accident, obviously. I just wanted to get out. And so, again, I wound up seeing and getting, an, for the first time, an email from Hay House. I know it. You yeah. can be a mover and shaker. And I was like, oh, my gosh. That's what I really want to do. I want to be a mover and shaker. And I went for a weekend doing that class. And right after that, I'm home on workers' comp and I'm getting phone calls for more readings. Now, meanwhile, I had been doing part-time readings all along in dribs and drab. But now I'm in North Carolina and I'm out of work in workers' comp and I'm getting phone calls from people from word of mouth. I hear that you're a psychic. Would you do a reading for me? Would you do a reading for me? And so now my part-time business was starting to go full-time. Then I was getting phone calls and emails. Would you speak for us? And I was being invited to speak at different lectures. And I'm like, after just taking the course and it led me into the direction of writing this book, where I am now speaking on all different shows like your own. And it was all because I finally said, you know, lead me to where I'm supposed to be. That's how I got here. And that's incredible because all your life, it seemed each thing that happened in your life took you to the next step, you know, including those two uh, accidents. It took me, and you know what? And I want people to understand this. You got to listen to this part. You don't have to get hit by a car or in an accident in order to go to the next step. It, you have to listen to your inner voice. Look, I was told at the age of 28 that I was going to be a spiritual teacher, but I couldn't accept that because I wanted so desperately, I thought, to be an actor, to be a singer, a dancer. But all of that pre-work helped me to be able to do the work I'm doing now. Now, don't get me wrong, because there's some people that think just because I have this big personality, yes, I'm an entertainer, but I also have a t-shirt that says, I'm not loud, I'm Italian. Okay, <laughs> so I'm Italian and I come from New York. There's one part. But I do believe in everything that I'm teaching, Blaine. And sometimes, especially with the way life is going now, you have to be bolder and stronger to be able to get that message through. This, this book took me 40 years of my life to do this. And it's because I got to understand the human mind so much. I can see the anomalies that go on in the brain that get in people's way. Because my, my, the major thing I learned through all of this is that most people don't believe what they think they believe. They think they believe it, but that's actually the defense mechanisms that have created a set of beliefs to shield you from what you're really believing about yourself. And that's why people have such a hard time. Look, how many books are out there on the market today in the spiritual world, in the metaphysical world, in the paranormal world on how to manifest your life using the law of attraction? We're unlimited beings. Even the just if you want to take the spiritual stuff out, there's all these self-help psychology books on how you can create the life you want. Don't sweat the small stuff. Create the big stuff. All of that there. And people are still saying it's not working. It's not working. God, it's not working. That was actually the original name of my book is God, it's not working. I do a whole lecture on that. And the point is, it's not working because we're manifesting beings, but we don't manifest just with our thoughts. That's a misunderstanding. Yes, thoughts create, but what they create are beliefs. And it's your inner core beliefs that manifest, not just what you think. 
if what you thought created instantaneously, we would have major problems. Can you imagine that? <laughs> half the world would be dead. The other half would be billionaires from winning the lottery all the time. <laughs> Right. Just oh, a thought, you know, think about you growing up and you're having a fight with your friend and you accidentally got a banger. You go, ah, drop dead. Oh, my God. And you <laughs> created and manifested from the thought, you know, mom killed me when I broke the lamp. Now I killed my brother. What now, oh, man? I'm in trouble now. It can't be that. So it's from the unconscious mind. And it's some me, deep down stuff. As we're running out of time here, let me just go now. Oh, to the book goodness. itself. So. At some point in time, then you decide to write a book. When did you decide to write the book? Well, actually, over 10 years ago. And right. this book is a different version of it because inspiration and a publisher and a really good editor helped to get the really good stuff out of me. That's deep stuff that everybody can use. Okay. So now the name of the book, and you can see it in the back, and I have my copy is The Secret That's Holding You Back. When did it come out, Vince? It actually releases June 21st this year, but everybody can pre-order it. And that's the, the funny thing. I, I never wrote a book before, but you find out that act, because of Amazon and all different fine retailers that it's online now, their rankings determine how much that gets out into the world. And so I've been fortunate already because it's been a number one bestseller. Um, and the ranking has been so high, even though it's all pre-orders, it's still a bestseller. Um, so I'm very excited about that. But it's the type of book that everybody can use, especially if they want to grow their life in any way, Blaine. Now, does the book also, because I'm, I'm fascinated by your story, does the book also talk about your story, how you, you got to there? Uh, well, that's so funny. My first book did... But okay. most of the publishers wanted your memoir. They then called it a memoir. Right. It's like, no, it's self-help with memoir. So actually, they wanted me to tell some other people's stories. Mine snuck in there a little, but they said, let your second book be your memoir about your story. So I get to tell my story on shows like yours and every other show that I wind up doing. But the book is other people's stories and then everything that I learned that I put together. That's, in the, that's the first book. Yes, that's this book now. Oh, the secret. The second book will be about me, I okay. guess. And so, Vince, if folks want to find out more about you, encourage you to read the book, The Secret That's Holding You Back. Uh, do you have a website or Facebook page? How to find out Absolutely. more? Absolutely. They can go to vincentjenna.com. That's with a G E N N A, like it says in the book, vincentjenna.com. Connect with me there, register online there with me, and you will receive different information about where I am, some very insp inspirational um, content. Uh, I have my Facebook and all my social media links there. Everybody can connect with me. And if you write me, I answer you. And I do a lot of different events and live Facebook events. And that'll all be on that website that people will be directed to. So and, absolutely join me. And thank you for asking. And as a compliment to you, I have to say that's one of the reasons we're speaking today, because exactly what you said uh, just before, that somehow I communicated with you. And you instantaneously, I was so impressed with that, responded right away. We became somehow, I don't know, someday we'll meet sometime, but we became like friends just because you responded, you know. And Absolutely, I, Blaine, so, because so, I, I am. I walk my talk. I know some people think, like I said, I'm over the top, but I'm genuine over the top. I believe everything that I'm saying. Now, I don't necessarily believe everything that I'm saying is absolute, but I absolutely believe everything I'm saying. And one last time, Vincent, the website is what, please? VincentJenna.com. Okay. I'd like to thank you for being my guest the second half hour on the Planes World Show. Also to uh, Nancy Lawson, guest on the first half, Cappy Tazetti, my producer. And I look forward to seeing you next Wednesday here at 9 a.m. on WPVM 103.7 in Asheville, North Carolina. Thanks, Vince.